Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the White House for your daily briefing. It is uh, always a pleasure to see you. I have a couple of things I want to say at the top. First, following the President's State of the Union address, uh, he will begin a five-state, three-day swing across the country. He will begin his trip with a visit to the Cedar Rapids area, followed by an event in the Phoenix area, before traveling to Las Vegas on January 25th. On January 26th, the President will hold events in the Las Vegas area and the Denver area before traveling to Detroit that evening. The following day, January 27th, the President will deliver remarks in the Detroit area before returning to Washington, D.C. More details, including information about the President's events and media credentialing, will be released as they are available. Secondly, I want to anticipate uh, a number of questions you may have uh, on a particular subject uh, based on uh, reporting, uh, sourcing, and uh, anonymous sources uh, uh, about the Keystone Pipeline. And uh, I just want to get it out of the way up front that I'm not going to confirm uh, uh, any reports. Uh, I'm not going to get ahead of the administration of the Secretary of State or the President. Um, uh, we may have more information for you about that uh, later today, but I'm not going to get uh, ahead of uh, uh, the Secretary of State or the President. Uh, I would. Uh, simply ask that you review the facts here, which is that uh, uh, in a precedent established uh, long ago that is held through many administrations, both Democratic and Republican, pipelines like Keystone that cross transnational borders, as this one would, uh, the permits for those pipelines have been reviewed uh, in a process led by the State Department. Uh, that was the case here. When, in the case of Keystone, a pipeline, uh, uh, concerns were raised about the environmental impacts on the air and water quality in Nebraska by, among others, the governor of Nebraska, a Republican, uh, a decision was made that an alternate route be sought and that, therefore, the process had to be delayed so that an adequate review could be undertaken following the same standards that have always been in place, that were in the place, that were in place in the beginning of this process for this particular pipeline and that have been in place for these kinds of projects for many years. In uh, a purely partisan effort to score a political point, Republicans in Congress insisted on inserting an extraneous provision within a bill that had nothing to do with pipelines but was a bill to extend a tax cut to 160 million Americans, a tax cut that this President fought very hard to get and to extend. Even prior to the signing of that legislation, the State Department, which again reviews this process, made clear that uh, setting an arbitrary deadline through this uh, purely political effort would uh, put the State Department in a corner, would severely uh, hamper their ability to review an alternate route and a new pipeline route in the proper way, a way that uh, has long been established by precedent and that would take into consideration all the criteria that are so important in decisions like this, uh, economic impact, national security impact, environmental impact, the effect on the water that our children breathe and or rather the water our children drink and the air that they breathe. Um, they made clear that the State Department in a statement prior to the signing of this legislation that imposing an arbitrary 60-day deadline on this process would uh, make it virtually impossible for an adequate review to take place of a route, an alternate route, that to this day does not yet exist. Um, so I am simply reviewing the facts as we know them. Yeah, but he signed the law. It uh, says he has and to do we, that. We made clear, well, it, it, he signed a law that forced the, uh, a decision to be made in an arbitrary fashion, no question. And I don't have an announcement about any, de any uh, decision that would be uh, forthcoming on that. Uh, but I'm just reviewing the facts uh, as they uh, existed uh, yesterday as well as today. Well, thanks, so let, me to, says let, me, he maybe let me let me get Eric. Well, to follow up on that, you're saying that you don't want to get ahead of the President or the State Department. But the law specifies that it is the president's mm -hmm. decision. So, is there any reason that this announcement would come from the State Department? And yeah, I don't. I'm not going to get into details about. Uh, I, you know, I made clear that, that we may have more information for you on that uh, later today, uh, and I'll 
uh, look to that. Uh, uh, I would urge you to look to that for guidance on that and question. Just to be clear, are you saying that there has not been a decision made, or you're not? I, I'm, I'm saying not saying uh, one way or the other regarding that. And can you speak to some of the Republican criticism that's already coming? out um, <coughs> anticipating what the decision will be that the president hates jobs, et cetera? Well, I, I think I did anticipate some of that in my, in my opening remarks, but I would, I would make clear that uh, there is a proper process that has existed for many years and many administrations by which a project like this is reviewed and a permit is either granted or denied. Because of concerns expressed by uh, numerous stakeholders, including the Republican governor of Nebraska, it was decided that an alternate route through Nebraska was necessary. The choosing of that alternate route has not even been completed yet. The State Department, which uh, conducts and oversees this uh, multi-agency review process, made clear at the time in December that inserting this extraneous provision uh, as in an attempt to get a political victory because for some reason extending a tax cut to 160 million Americans wasn't victory enough, uh, the Republicans put in jeopardy a process that should be immune from politics, should, should be uh, conducted on the basis of uh, pragmatic and considered um, analysis, and, and tried to hijack it. Uh, through that. And, that. and the State Department warned that that uh, would create serious problems. So um, the President's commitment to job creation has been amply demonstrated by the policies that he has pursued, uh, that he has signed into law, that have contributed considerably to the creation of 3.2 uh, million private sector jobs. Uh, they've been demonstrated by his uh, fierce commitment to doing everything he can, both working with Congress and acting independently to further assist the economy as it recovers from the worst recession since the Great Depression, to further assist the economy as it creates more jobs. Uh, most notably, recently, the, uh, his proposal, the American Jobs Act, which, if the Republicans were uh, committed to job creation, uh, they would uh, join with him in making sure that all of the provisions of that law became, of that proposal became law, including uh, the provision that would put 400,000 teachers and first responders back to work, provision that would help us rebuild our infrastructure and put idle construction workers back to work, uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of uh, Americans who would have jobs would, were the Republicans to uh, finish the work of passing the American Jobs Act. So um, that would be my answer to that criticism. Jay. You say that the, the move by Congress to force the President and the State Department to, to make a decision within 60 days about this pipeline is, is partisan. Mm -hmm. How is it any less political for the President faced with a difficult choice between jobs and environmental concerns, with two important constituencies for his reelection, to say, you know what, I'm going to delay a decision on this until after the reelection in November 2012? How, how is that any less political than what Congress well, did? Because there is an established process by which these reviews are conducted when, uh, because of the concerns expressed by many stakeholders, including the Republican governor of Nebraska, a decision was made that an alternate route needed to be considered, that process needed to be delayed and that the full review needed to be conducted uh, on the alternate route. I mean, that's, that's the way this process is supposed to work. What would have happened and, if the President and hadn't intervened? If the President had the made State Department, decision. first of all, the, again, the decision to create an alternate route was made based on the requests of stakeholders affected by uh, the original route, including, again, the governor of Nebraska and others in that state. Uh, and that necessitated, as deemed by the State Department, which has to conduct this review, uh, the postponement and, and, and the allowance of the enough time to uh, thoroughly review the new route. Again, I think it's important to note that, uh, as the State Department made clear, that the 60 days is simply not enough time. We don't even have an alternate route identified yet, so how could anyone possibly review it thoroughly uh, in the manner that is expected in this process? So, look, I, the point is, is that this, these things are supposed to uh, 
be decided in a methodical, responsible manner so that all these criteria are properly weighed because, because uh, a decision like this uh, has uh, long-term implications for our economy and for our environment, uh, for our national security. Uh, and those criteria all have to be considered as the decision is being made. The effort to score a political point in a process that was wholly unrelated because they were unhappy about um, the fact that the president was pushing for a payroll tax cut extension for 160 million Americans, um, I don't think uh, makes a lot of substantive sense in terms of uh, the issue that uh, proponents of that course say they care about, which is uh, you know, the, a decision that needs to be made on a pipeline and, and the potential economic, positive economic impacts that that would have. Um, you got to let the process <coughs> unfold the way it's supposed to unfold without this kind of extraneous political uh, interference, and uh, and then a decision would be made on the merits. Would you clear this up, though? Sure. The president signed this into law. It mm -hmm. says that unless he finds that it is not in the national interest of the United States mm -hmm. uh, within 60 days, then the project will go ahead. He takes no action. It leaves the State Department out of the equation and puts it squarely on the president. Uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to preview for you uh, any information we might have about this uh, process or decision uh, prior to that taking place. I'm not quibbling with the legislation the President signed into law. I am making a broader statement about who conducts the review and the fact that the State Department, which again through decades of precedent conducts this review, made clear back in December what uh, it felt the impact would be of an arbitrary deadline set by, uh, you know, for political reasons. So, uh, I mean, if your issue is like, if your concern here is who's going to make the decision, I, you know, I'll, I'll uh, suggest you wait for the decision well, to be made. Well, the logical extension there would be that the President would find that it's not in the national interest to just go ahead. Well, I would point you to what the State Department said, that it would be impossible uh, or highly unlikely, if not impossible, to conduct a proper <laughs> review. Uh, of an alternate route that, again, on January 18th, 2011, does not even exist. So how could you possibly review it? He have to do it. Again, I, uh, I, I point you to the future, 2012. What did I say? I don't think I've made that mistake in any checks I've written so far this month. But Hasn't the Nebraska governor said that he doesn't have these concerns anymore and he's okay? Because you keep citing him, but he's since well, said... Well, he's not okay with the, with the, pro with the original route. That's, that was one of the primary reasons but why a decision. It should go forward while an alternate route is looked at, uh, though. You know, you don't you don't get, grant a permit for a prod, uh, for a, a pipeline with uh, a significant portion of it missing. Okay, you're citing that he's opposed, but he's saying he was opposed to, before. His opposition was important to the decision to seek an alternate route, uh, which then delayed the process, and then the the process uh, requires the permitting of the full pipeline. It's not a, you know, partial uh, proposition. I want to go to Jack. Can we stay on that? Yeah, we can. But I'll just, get. just, I'm going to change the subject very yeah. quickly. Um, uh, officials in Iran have said that they've reached out to uh, Western powers to discuss restarting negotiations over their new program soon. So do you have any response to that? And could you talk about your uh, the administration's attitude towards getting back to the negotiating table with Iran? Well, I, uh, our position has been clear and has not changed for uh, a long, long time here. We have made clear from the beginning when the President took office that uh, the path is open to Iran to uh, get right with the international community, to fulfill its international obligations abide by its commitments, uh, and uh, that the international community, including the United States, would be willing to work with Iran if it were willing to do that uh, to ensure, for example, that it had uh, access to uh, nuclear technology for, for non-military purposes. The, and, that, and that stands. Iran's behavior and its refusal to engage in serious discussions about this issue, uh, its refusal refusal to live up to its uh, international obligations, its persistence in um, pursuing a nuclear program uh, in a manner that's uh, not consistent with those international obligations has led to the uh, consistent ratcheting up of pressure on Iran, led by the United States, but together with 
um, many, many international allies and partners, uh, and that that process continues. And it has uh, put enormous pressure on Iran. Uh, it has isolated Iran, uh, and that continues. But the, the fact remains that, that there is an alternate course here available to Iran should it uh, respond to the letter from the P5 plus one and be willing to uh, live up to its obligations. This, this is a simple choice that has been available to Iran uh, from the beginning. And um, in general, thank you, Jane. In general, the president doesn't oppose the construction of pipelines. After all, this is just an extension of an existing one. Overall, the president uh, thinks that they're a, uh, an important part of the oil infrastructure. Definitely, and and I think that's an important point to make, which I think I made yesterday, which is that this president's commitment to expanding domestic oil and gas production is uh, firm and has been demonstrated by the fact that. Uh, again, in 2011, as was the case in 2010, the United States produced more oil and gas than at any time since 2003. And he has continued to uh, make uh, more territory available, uh, both in the Gulf and in Alaska and elsewhere, to uh, production and, and uh, development. And he has done that in a way that, uh, at the same time, man maintains the, the standards of safety and, and responsible development that he thinks are key. So uh, he takes an all-of-the-above approach here. He believes firmly that we need to um, continue to uh, exploit, if you will, our domestic resources. Uh, he, we need to continue to invest in clean energy technologies. And doing so, taking this approach that includes oil, natural gas, uh, nuclear power, uh, and, and, and clean energy, other clean energy technologies is, is, is uh, the best energy policy and the surest way to ensure that we increase our improve our national security and reduce our dependence on foreign oil. Um, and so, uh, there, this is not an either. This is not an either-or proposition. It's a both-and. You can do this. You can increase domestic oil and gas production, as has been the case on his watch, and do it in a safe and responsible way. And doing it in a safe and responsible way includes ensuring that the proper reviews are conducted for a proposal like this key, uh, Keystone Pipeline, uh, in accordance with long-standing bipartisan tradition in multiple administrations. This, of course, is an extension to Canadian oil fields. Does he have a, an opinion on tar sands, whether those are an appropriate uh, place to, uh, well, to the, the president oil? is uh, a firm believer in the fact that we need, that we can and we must uh, develop uh, energy sources uh, in a safe and responsible way. And, and, and obviously there are, you have to take a, a lot of factors into consideration when you do that. Um, the uh, the overall issue here is about economic security and national security, and that's why it is so important to uh, embrace uh, the possibility of further development uh, and ensure that we do it in a way that's safe and responsible. And that, that, that's true for oil, it's true for natural gas, it's true for nuclear, and it's true for uh, clean air technology. I mean, sorry, clean energy technology. Getting ahead of myself. Mr. Henry, again. Thank you. Can I follow up on Iran real quick and mm -hmm. then a question on taxes? Um, it seems to answer Alistair by talking about the P5 plus one, uh, and that is a channel the U.S. can use. But uh, there's a lawmaker in Iran and the foreign minister in Iran are both on the record saying that a letter has come from President Obama directly to the Supreme Leader saying that there should be direct U.S.-Iranian talks. Has such a letter been written, and are you open to direct talks? Uh, our position has not changed. We. Uh, any communications we may have had with or may have with the Iranians uh, are the same in private as they have been in public, and that is uh, in, along the lines of what I just restated in terms of our position and our policy. The P5 plus one structure is in place. If the Iranians are serious about restarting talks, then, then they need to respond to that letter. That is the channel by which, uh, the, the, the mode by which um, the restarting of those talks uh, would take place. Our Again, our expression of our position is the same in private as it is in public. The, 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 the statement that uh, there is a path here towards renewed talks and a path here for Iran to pursue, if it so chooses, that would allow it to get right with the international community, that would allow it to um, uh, stop the process that has isolated it further and further. Um, has been apparent from the beginning, and it remains available to Iran to this day. Um, but Iran has shown no inclination thus far uh, to make that choice, to make that 
decision. And, and what we have seen over the three years since this president's been in office is uh, he has, uh, by pursuing uh, the Iranian issue in the way that he has, he has um, ensured that uh, a world that was uh, uh, in conflict over this issue is now united in the international community, and an Iran that was united uh, is now in conflict. And, the, uh, and that is the effect that the President's uh, policies have had uh, on Iran and on this process. He has uh, brought to bear a level of consensus in the international community in, on, on the need to pressure Iran and isolate Iran on this issue that uh, did not exist prior to him taking office. Well, can you address, going back to the 08 campaign, uh, then uh, Republican candidate John McCain was complaining that direct talks with Iran that the President had talked about then in the campaign would show weakness because why would you sit down with a country uh, for direct talks the that President says they want to wipe Israel off the map? The always made clear that the, the, the process by which negotiations or talks would take place is the P5 plus one. The President has always made clear uh, that, as he did when he took office, as he stated during the campaign, uh, that by offering the possibility of resolving this dispute with the Iranians through negotiations and talks um, would strengthen the United States' hand because if Iran agreed to do that and fulfilled its international obligations and abandoned its nuclear, its pursuit of a nuclear weapon, uh, that would be to the greater good and to the, uh, in the interest of the United States as well as its allies and partners around the world. And if it did not, it would be clear to the whole world that Iran was the problem here not the United States. And that is exactly what has happened. Uh, we have a level of international consensus about uh, Iranian behavior that uh, we did not have before. Uh, we have a situation where um, Iran's economy is clearly suffering from the uh, effects of the international sanctions regime, and as well as the unilateral sanctions that various nations have uh, placed on Iran, uh, on Iran. And that isolation has caused uh, disunity within the Iranian leadership um, uh, and made clear to the world uh, that they have isolated themselves outside of international norms. Last thing on taxes. Um, yesterday when Nora asked you about Mitt Romney saying that his tax rate is around 15 percent, this gets back to the old thing that you mentioned, the President's mentioned, about Warren Buffett paying less than the Secretary because of the rate that capital gains are taxed. What is the President's, from a policy standpoint, what then is his solution? I mean, he's talked about various things like the Buffett rule and whatnot, but in terms of law, is it to bring capital gains tax rates up closer to income tax rates so that's more fair? Mm -hmm. Is it, you know, what is his prescription there? Well, I, I appreciate the question, Ed, and it's, it's, it's a legitimate one. The President has made clear what his principles uh, are uh, in terms of tax reform. He is for both corporate tax reform and individual tax reform, and one of the principles that he would bring to the table in the development of individual tax reform is the Buffett rule, uh, which would uh, ensure that millionaires and billionaires, uh, because of the nature of their income, do not pay at a lower rate than middle class Americans, that, that Warren Buffett does not pay a lower rate in taxes than his secretary, as, as Mr. Buffett himself has said. Uh, how, there, how you get there is the, a matter that I will leave to the President uh, and others to propose because uh, tax reform is a, uh, you know, there are many ways to skin the cat and it's a complicated process. But the principle of the Buffett rule is one that he believes is very important because it goes right to the situation we were talking about yesterday and that, and that you raise, and that is that um, it, it, it simply, as a matter of fairness, uh, does not make a lot of sense for millionaires and billionaires to be able to pay be, uh, taxes at a much lower rate than somebody making $100,000 a year or less. Um, uh, and so that is a principle he would bring to bear here. Um, it is particularly, you know, you, you, there are a variety of ways that, that, that there are a variety of loopholes within the tax code that, or elements of the tax, hold as well, tax code as well as loopholes within it that, that create that situation, not least of which, and he's identified this, is the carried interest loophole that allows hedge fund managers and private equity managers to take income for their labor and have it taxed at a capital gains rate. Um, the President believes that's just, you know, in, in, in the world that we live in right now, uh, when middle class Americans are struggling, when they've seen their wages stagnate or decline, when uh, there's enormous economic pressure on uh, hardworking American families, that's just not fair. 
Uh, and we, you know, we have important things that we need to do in terms that, that to ensure that America is strong and that our economy is uh, powerful in the 21st century. And so we need to make sure that everyone has a fair shot and everyone pays a fair share. April. Uh, Jay, back on Keystone. Um, realistically, a timeline, now that there's been a rejection, when do you, what's the timeline as far as an alternative route? What do you think that when do you think you'll I, I would refer to April. First of all, I, I don't have any announcements to make regarding any decisions on this, so um, I would just take issue with your question in that regard. But you can give an answer, so but, you can take Well, I've been, I've been reviewing facts that, that have been true uh, prior to today. The, uh, as for pipeline proposals that of the nature that are, you know, of, uh, of the nature of Keystone that are transnational, I mean, those, those would go th through the normal channels, through the State Department. Uh, and, and their duration in terms of the review process would be, uh, again, absent uh, extraneous political interference would, 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 would take place in the, normal, uh, in the normal manner. So, but that's just the way the process exists. 60 days in a 60 day process. Well, the 60 day thing was, a, was the, you know, a uh, arbitrary <laughs> element inserted into an uh, unrelated tax cut bill. But uh, that's not how the process works. The process works uh, in the manner that the State Department has uh, run, uh, designed and run it for many years. And the reason why I ask that question is because there are already concerns about the fact that tens of, quote unquote, tens of thousands of jobs mm -hmm. will be lost because of this rejection. So would you consider this more so of a deferment of job creation? Well, let me, let me just make clear here. At, as the State Department decided and the President concurred, the review process was extended because of a decision to change the route. That process should be allowed to take its course. The review should be allowed to be conducted in the appropriate way with all factors weighed and considered, overseen by the State Department. Um, that is certainly the way this thing should happen. Unfortunately, because of the uh, decision by uh, Republicans to insert this extraneous provision within a tax cut bill, uh, you know, there is this arbitrary deadline of 60 days uh, forcing the administration's hand. The, um, but again, the broader, the, the broader process will continue to work the way it has always worked, again, predating this administration. I'm talking about the issue of job creation that this, comes this, from the, this, and well, people are screaming that, that tens of thousands of jobs are lost now April, because of this. You have to, this, these, these projects you have to weigh a variety of considerations, economic impact, environmental impact, health and safety, um, national security, and that's the way it should be. Uh, there are uh, hundreds of thousands of teachers and first responders who could go back to work uh, right away if, if Congress would act on the American Jobs Act, if Republicans would stop blocking the provisions within the American Jobs Act that this president proposed and Democrats support. There are uh, tens of thousands of construction workers, infrastructure jobs, not unlike a building of a pipeline, who could be going back to work rebuilding our infrastructure, making us more competitive for the 21st century uh, if Republicans would support, as they often have in the past, uh, the kind of infrastructure investments that are included in the American Jobs Act. And again, as we've said earlier, I've said earlier this month uh, in briefings, we, uh, we um, remain optimistic that that kind of cooperation could be forthcoming this year because it really is incumbent upon every elected member of Congress as well as the President to work together uh, towards these, uh, uh, towards the goal of improving our economy and, 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 and creating jobs. Kristen. Thanks, Jay. <clears throat> Just to follow up a bit on what April is asking, the bottom line is the Keystone Pipeline has become a political lightning rod this year. So what's the administration's level of concern that the debate itself has really, in some ways, pitted this administration against some unions who are saying this would put them back to work. I would simply say that on issues like this, uh, there is a non-political, professional process that has been in place, was established long before this administration came to office, uh, and is the proper way to, to conduct the reviews for applications for permits for these kinds of transnational projects. That review process is run by the State Department. 
It was being run by the State Department. A change in the route was made because of concerns expressed, uh, legitimate concerns expressed by stakeholders in, the, uh, in Nebraska and elsewhere. Uh, and because of that, the process had to be extended. That's how it's supposed to work. Uh, there are a lot of factors to weigh in these kinds of decisions, including national security factors, issues of the health and safety of our children and um, the residents of folks uh, in the area of, of any proposed pipeline, uh, economic impacts, job impacts, uh, the effect on, on uh, our energy security. So, and that's the kind of process that the State Department oversees. It, it, it involves inputs from many agencies, and that's the way this should proceed. It should not become, as you say, highly political in the way that um, it has become because of the decision to insert an extraneous provision within a tax cut bill. And I understand there is a non-political process, but given that, given that we're in a re-election year, isn't it impossible for this not to well, take it, some it, sort of a it, It's up to uh, others to decide how political they want to be about any kind of decision like this. These, you know, this, this president, this administration is tasked with the responsibility of reviewing these matters in a way uh, that's appropriate, that takes into consideration all the different criteria that uh, need to be brought to bear in a decision like this. And, and that's the, that's the uh, approach the State Department has taken, the President has taken, and will continue to take. And just to ask one quick one on another topic, Jay. Um, Representative Peter King, Chairman of the House Homeland Security Committee, um, as you know, back in August raised some concerns over Catherine Bigelow's upcoming uh, Osama bin Laden movie. Uh, raised some concerns that there were potentially some classified information that was leaked about uh, the kill and capture of Osama bin Laden. Last week, the CIA and the Defense Department officially opened an investigation up into this project. What's the administration's <coughs> reaction? Well, the CIA and the Defense Department are part of the administration, what? and I would point you to them and their just you know and, the, and and their announcement of their uh, look into this. Uh, what I made clear at the time is that uh, there was some some loose reporting in a column about um, what the White House did. And I made clear that in discussing uh, that m mission and, and those days uh, with uh, folks involved in making this film or writing books or articles or doing TV pieces, we said all the same things and none of it was classified. And you're confident that this investigation Well, again, I, I would refer you to the Defense Department and the CIA I'm, I, at this, at, in, in, with regard to that because I was part of that process with regard to the White House's engagement with uh, reporters like everyone in this room, practically, as well as others who are working on magazine articles or books or films, um, you know, we provided the same information to everybody and none of it was classified. Ms. Laura. My question is a process question. Why, knowing as you do the interest in the Keystone issue, and knowing as you do that this decision is going to be announced later today, why would you announce it after the briefing and therefore put yourself in a position where you won't answer any questions about it? Um, and where we won't have well, an I'm opportunity. Well, I'm not going anywhere. You know, you guys can answer, ask me questions. Uh, you know, I'm here most days, uh, uh, and you know, okay. right, you're welcome to fill the seats. So, the you know, <laughs> I know it's hard to believe, but um, the schedule of uh, decision making and policy processes and stuff are not all dependent on my schedule or the briefing schedule or the communication shop, uh, and. Uh, and that's how it should be. So, uh, again, uh, I, you know, it's a, you guys probably don't like me to brief in the middle of the evening or something. So I would just point you to uh, uh, to the fact that we may have something more to say about this later today. Margaret. Thanks. Um, on Keystone, um, without without confirming a rejection, can you explain to us? What a rejection would mean. In other words, <laughs> no, 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 I'm not, I'm not being too serious. I'm no, totally good question. Serious. Okay, so if Trans Canada has to submit a new route, mm -hmm. does that just like does the clock start at zero again? Are we looking at another 10-year process? You can say that House Republicans forced their hand on that, but I'm trying to understand what does what would a rejection mean? Would a rejection mean? Well, let me make two points. The complete beginning. Let me make two points. First of all. These reviews are conducted by the State Department, and, and the details of how they work um, are best explained by the State Department. However, I would point out that absent the 
payroll tax cut and the insertion of an extraneous provision within it that had created this arbitrary 60-day deadline, there was a process in place that wasn't 10 years, but when the route had been changed was, I think it was 18 months, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so, and that's because that's the amount of time that the State Department believes uh, was necessary, would be necessary to properly review an alternate route. I would refer you to the State Department for more details about how that process generally works depending on, uh, you know, whatever decision was made uh, because of the necessity created out of this uh, legislation. White House's understanding that this would probably begin another 18-month time clock then? I can I'll ask I, our I State just, Department I, reporters I, I, to ask them. I don't, I don't have a, a White House view to express on, on that except for what I just said, which is that the process, I mean, that because that depends on a lot of factors, including uh, the outcome of this decision. But the, you know, as you noted in even your question, there are uh, players in this process, including companies, private companies. Uh, there's uh, another country involved, which is the reason why it's, uh, why the State Department is engaged in this. Uh, so I would be, uh, I would not want to speculate. It may have been eight months from now that you guys gave her the green light. And what I'm asking is, is that option now totally obviated? Is, is that no longer I would, I would just refer you to the State Department. I don't, I, don't, I just don't have details for that. And again, it's, it's, it's based on the premise of a decision that I'm not announcing from here. And any White House reaction um, in just working principle as you've gone through your day has uh, have the internet uh, pr provider and website protests uh, affected you guys in, in any way? Well, I, I, don't, I don't have any effects or impacts to that I've noted Hello. beyond to, to point out that we made very clear over the weekend our views on this, and we had tremendous uh, response uh, to uh, our, our We the People initiative. And, and, you know, we think it's it's an important process here that, that has been conducted where there's a lot of uh, external input uh, and uh, expressed about uh, the, the, the many important issues that are uh, at stake. And as, as our firm belief is that we need to uh, do something about online piracy by foreign web pi uh, websites, uh, but we need to do it in a way that um, does not impinge upon a free and open internet. And uh, what that means is that both sides, you know, loosely defined, the two sides in this issue need to come together and uh, find a solution that strikes a balance. Uh, and that I think that process has been benefited, uh, has been benefited by the uh, the, the the interest and the number of voices that have been uh, heard on this issue. Um, you know, we've been really uh, um, impressed by the the volume of response that we've gotten uh, online to to what we put out over the weekend. Uh, Leslie, and then I'll um, Jake, and then Jackie. Jackie. Can you give us a little bit more on the president's visit to Florida tomorrow and some of the Republican criticism that he's going to be there just a few days before Republican GOP candidates will arrive? After South Carolina and polls are down in the state for him. Well, you know, I I have discussed his travel. I mean, he 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 goes to states all across the country, and every president uh, should uh, travel across the country to meet with Americans from uh, as many states as possible, and that, and that, and that's a principle this president uh, pursues. You know, he will travel tomorrow to Florida, to Orlando, uh, to Walt Disney World. Um, uh, where he will un unveil a strategy that will significantly help boost the tourism and travel, uh, which is an important and sometimes overlooked sector in the U.S. economy. Uh, the action will be taken as part of the President's We Can't Wait agenda of executive actions that will aid job growth and do not require congressional approval, which goes back to the point I made earlier, which is uh, he's pursuing every avenue possible here to uh, tackle what he thinks is our most important challenge, which is growing the economy, creating jobs, positioning the American economy to uh, compete and dominate in the 21st century. And, and this is uh, another indication of that effort. I think. Um, and you're saying a few days out from the uh, Florida primary being started, it has nothing uh, to do with Look, you could argue that, but first of all, our, 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 our schedules are made you know, with a lot of different considerations uh, well in advance. Um, you know. I think I read reports uh, 
a few weeks ago that this thing would be over after Iowa. Or, you know, it's like you, you can't. That would that would or that it could go on until May as it did in or June as it did in 2008. You know, that would make it impossible us for if we were guessing in the weeks in advance that we make travel arrangements like this, it would make it very hard for us to go uh, to many, many places. You know, this is obvious. It's obvious when you're making a tourism and travel announcement that uh, one of the premier sites of uh, U.S. tourism industry is Orlando. So it seems pretty self-evident um, that you would do that. So, sure. Disappointed the Senator Nelson won't be living tomorrow in Orlando? Uh, I don't. Uh, I, 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 I'm not aware uh, of any opinion he's expressed on that. Apart from general State of the Union yes, follow-up, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, nice uh, apart from general State of the Union follow-up, what's the president's message next week on this five-state tour? Uh, well, I, since he'll be uh, talking about the subjects that he raised in the State of the Union, if I were to talk about the subjects he'll raise in the states that he visits, uh, uh, I would be getting ahead of the president. <laughs> so, uh, look, I, I, I think. One thing you can be sure of, and this is broadly speaking, not, not you shouldn't rule out other subjects, but that he is fiercely focused on economic growth and job creation and, and pursuing every, using every tool available to him to uh, assist in that project. Um, so that will certainly be a, a, a topic generally of uh, his address next week. And it will be a topic that he discusses on the road, both uh, after the State of the Union and beyond, as he has uh, so frequently uh, prior to the State of the Union. And I appreciate that you know the Florida plan had nothing to do with the fact that Florida is about to vote. And then he's going to Nevada, which is the next state up to vote. <laughs> it seems awfully coincidental. Well, look, again, if we, we would have to rule out, remember what happened in 2008. We would have had to decide back in December or November, and that, you know, when we make decisions for fairly far in advance about where we're going to travel, that we couldn't go to any state that had a primary. That's 50 states, basically, or you know, because all of them could be uh, the place where the nomination was decided in the other party. We can't do that. This president, uh, as every president is, is president of all the United States of America, of all the people in the country, and he's going to travel around the country uh, to talk about the issues that are important to. Uh, Americans in every state, including, uh, most importantly, economic growth and job creation. Brianna. Hey, I'm um, sorry, did I miss you this whole time? I didn't, it's okay. Okay. Um, on Keystone, you talk about these are processes that have been in place in other administrations. I mean, the president has talked about kind of greasing the rails in some ways to create jobs. I mean, isn't this sort of one of those bureaucratic mountains that he's talked about well, moving? Well, you, 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 uh, eliminate red tape and you eliminate bureaucracy, you do the kinds of things that he has done uh, in an unprecedented move with his regulatory look back uh, um, process that has eliminated a lot of rules or, 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 uh, and regulations to, to make, uh, make uh, life easier for American businesses. Um, but you do that in a careful review to make sure that you're not eliminating processes or, 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 or rules that are uh, vital to uh, either health and safety of the American people or our national security, or our energy security. So, um, no, you don't. You don't ignore potential issues involving uh, the health and safety of uh, residents in numerous states who would be affected by this pipeline. Um, you have to. It's your responsibility, and that's why this process is always done in an, in a, in a manner that, that that's very thorough, very considered, that weighs uh, all the different factors that that. Um, are at stake here in a decision like this. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it I serve mean, the, the issue here is to, is to, to short circuit a process and approve a pipeline, uh, the, the route for which hasn't even been decided. I'm not saying in a haphazard way. Or proposed. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be better to move forward in some way in tandem with the state review, some way to move forward on this, instead of being hit, as he's going to be hit, over and over by Republicans who are saying, you know, according to TransCanada, this is 20,000 jobs, and they're going to put it over and over in different pieces of well, legislation, look, and it will be a fight if, over if, and if over. Isn't he better there, off there, there, forward there are somewhere? going to be a lot of fights, and I understand the Republicans, you know, for lack of alternative arguments to make on the proper way to balance our budget or on uh, tax reform or uh, 
how we should best pay for the kind of investments we need, or uh, why they oppose putting 400,000 teachers and first responders back to work, or why they oppose putting construction workers back to work, that they will grab onto some other arguments. But that doesn't mean the president doesn't have the responsibility and his administration doesn't have the responsibility to conduct a review like this properly and by the book. And that's how they're going to do it. These are private sector jobs. They don't require any expenditure by government. Uh, that, that's not the issue. The, the issue is the, uh, the impact that a development project like this, transnational development project like this, would have on uh, the health and safety of the American people in the region, uh, on our economic security, our uh, on, on, the, on job creation, on, on uh, uh, our energy security. These are, these are, uh, there's a variety of factors that have to be considered, and, and they, they, they should be considered. They should not be set aside out of, uh, you know, for, for political gain. I mean, let's go back to how this happened, right? The president was making a very compelling argument about the need to implement the provision within the American Jobs Act that would extend the payroll tax cut. His original proposal was to expand the payroll tax cut so that Americans got 160 mi million Americans got a bigger tax cut this year. Republicans went from opposing that to being ambivalent about it to suddenly deciding that they needed some because they were going to have to go along with it in the end because it was the right thing to do and their constituents were telling them it was the right thing to do to deciding they needed some sort of political victory uh, and this is what they settled on. Uh, an attempt to, hi you know, to hijack a process, to short circuit a, uh, a review process that needs to be conducted properly uh, in order that all the prerogatives here are considered. And that's how it should be, and that's how it will be. George. Oh, Jackie, sorry, I said you next. Um, on another issue that gets uh, constituencies against each other, you, you mentioned that on uh, Saturday's blog post about the um, issue of uh, intellectual property rights and piracy, that you were just trying to urge the sides to come together on a solution, but it was widely interpreted, um, you know, in some as, as the White House taking sides with Google against Hollywood. Um, well, why do you think that's the wrong way to look at it? Because, as I just stated, uh, we believe there is a need, absolutely, to address the problem of online piracy conducted by foreign websites, which is the real uh, driving issue here. Uh, we made clear in the statement that we put out over the weekend that we oppose uh, the so-called DNS filter. And we made clear what our principles are and in, in, in how we pursue, or how uh, the government ought to pursue uh, addressing the issue of online privacy. And, and, and in doing that, it, it, you know, it must not uh, impinge upon uh, the, the freedom of the internet because the internet is such a uh, vital resource for uh, our economy and, and for the American people. So, uh, but these are, th th there are, there are absolute issues here that, uh, and interests that all sides of this debate have and they're, they're legitimate and that's why there needs to be um, the kind of dialogue, we believe, uh, that could bring us to a, a resolution, that could result in a resolution that is balanced and, and uh, addresses concerns about online privacy but doesn't impinge upon the freedom of the internet. But you had uh, bills moving forward in each house towards mm -hmm. markup, and typically this administration is, if anything, deferential towards the legislative process in Congress. What? Did everybody hear that? Why the timing? <laughs> I mean, why was it timed? And and a Saturday. I mean, there's so many aspects of the timing of this that are unusual. Well, I I think there was a, a great deal of focus and interest and intensity on this issue. Um, you know, we had, we, we had the, the, the We the People process um, and uh, solicited opinions on, the, on this issue and, and, and the, the threshold was met for us to respond and we did. Um, I, I think it's entirely appropriate for us to put forward our view on this, this pending bills, as, as you stated, uh, at, at least on the provision in particular within one of them or both of them on the, on the DNS filter and on the overall principles that we think should guide this process. Um, anybody you. else? Okay, I'll do it. George, I owe you and then that'll be it. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. And then Cheryl, I know you're dying in the back there, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to clarify your answer to Ed. Are you confirming that the President sent a new letter to the leadership in Iran? I'm, I'm not. We don't discuss uh, specific communications, diplomatic communications. I would say that uh, we have a variety of channel, channels through which we 
can communicate with the Iranians uh, and that uh, any message we communicate to the Iranians about these issues is, would be entirely consistent with uh, what we've said publicly, what I've said publicly, the President, Secretary of State, and others, um, uh, and, and uh, you can be sure of that. Cheryl. Um, two personnel issues, but I love talking about that. Um, are you considering I have no personnel announcements to make. <laughs> Is the President considering Larry Summers to head the World Bank? I, I don't have any personnel announcements to make. And is, <laughs> um, and is the uh, president actively looking for a new OMB director, or is Jeff Zines going to stick around for a while? Well, he just became acting director for the second time, uh, you know, so I, I don't want to foreshadow anything. He, president uh, is very appreciative of Jeff's uh, excellent service so far, his willingness to be acting director in the past, his willingness to do this again now. This is a very important role. Uh, it's very important, uh, specifically as regards our uh, interactions with, with Congress. Um, so he's uh, very pleased that uh, Jeff is uh, taking on this responsibility. Yeah. As the President talks to Prime Minister Hopper. Uh, I, I don't have any foreign calls to announce. I, I just said I don't have any foreign calls to announce. Thanks. Am I the warm-up act? Yeah. I have no, uh, nothing more to say on the matter.